The Pacific Tower, now the South Island's tallest building, and Rachel and I have been given a chance to see what the city looks like two and a half years after the February quake. I'm looking down on the central city of Christchurch, it's so different now. Yeah. It's hard to imagine, eh, that like 80% of the buildings that made up this central area are going to be going. Most of them already have, you know, it's, mm. it's really hard to reconcile that. Although I remember pre-quake, you could say then that the place was sort of kind of floundering in its yeah. own way. Yeah. And an important part of the new plan is that they want to bring people back into the central city as opposed to CBD. Jared, you were there from the very beginning, filming right here in the centre of the city. Yes, I was indeed. Well, it seems to me that everyone has an opinion about how this new city might look, so I thought the best thing to do was to ask how the city is going to be. So I went to Roger Sutton, mm. and he gave us a guided tour. I've also this week caught up with a couple of small business people who are making a go of it in the city, and an artist who's, who's, who's um, come up with quite a moving tribute to what did happen here three years ago nearly. and a half years and finally they're getting rid of the barriers, you know. Mm. We can walk back down these streets again, reconnect with our city. And so it feels like it's coming back to normal almost, you know? Yeah. Or some sort of normal. Yeah, indeed. I was actually here when the earthquake happened. Right here? Yeah, yeah, I was blocked down on High Street um, getting a tattoo. No. Yeah, I've been finished four <gasps> minutes before the quake hit. Yes. And I was inside C1 right. when it actually happened. And of course that building's gone now. Yeah, it's a bit of a mess still, eh? Yeah, but it's not nearly as bad as it was, you know? Over this side, and everyone else over this side, we're going to move you through in two groups because we won't fit you all on the bus at one time. Six weeks after the February the 22nd earthquake, I travelled with the shop owners of Lower High Street as they were bussed into the city and given one hour to retrieve what they could from their businesses. For many, it was the first time they'd been into their places since the quake. C1 started 15 years ago. We'd really set out, you know, building up the brand and bringing the people in. It'd be hard for us to do that again. Okay. All right, mate. Okay. So we know business. Yep. To be honest, I just thought there'd be a hell of a mess to clean up the next day. Oh. You didn't know when we were in there how serious it was. Yep, sweet. Yeah, that is a machine. Oh, well, I'm just in the hole. All the heartbreaking and you see envy the clothes shops, I guess, because they can just um, come in and grab their stuff and hopefully start again. But I don't know if we can pick up, pick up C1 and move it. People from the first bus load need to go now. Cheers, mate. Sorry. The idea of doing it all again was daunting. It was pretty frightening. Yeah. We had a new family and our house was wrecked. It was easier for us to walk away, for sure. We would have been at the front door about here. I think it was here. High Street was one of the pinups of change in Christchurch. So it meant a lot to a lot of people. Sam and Fleur didn't want to leave the city and didn't want to start a business from scratch again. That was until the old post office became available. So um, that's what we did. We moved over the road. Into that building there. After the loss of the calf, we weren't sure if we were doing the right thing because we didn't know when do the fences come down and will the people come back. And that's when people really were coming to us saying how much it meant to them. People who met their spouse in the calf, people whose kids had grown up there and had subsequently worked in the calf. It meant a lot to a lot of people. It was their second home. This is our herb garden through here. There's all edible flowers. Um, 
and parsleys and chives and things here. People's thinking is broader now. It's enabled us to do things like we've planted a community vegetable garden out the front of the cafe. Is it still High Street? I mean, we joke about it. We, um, you know, no one's coming in with their, yeah. their boutique bags and all the rest of it anymore. But we feel it's just kind of reset itself. The parking's as good as it used to be. C1's still there. And people have returned. People and, people, have and people are coming back. <laughs> with the business, we wanted it to be the greatest cafe in the world. And the only place we felt that we could do that was here in Christchurch. This is our home, we're committed. It's always been our home, so nothing's changed. We just want it to be a better place. C1's an example of something being done. I want it to be a benchmark. Um, I want people to come in here and see that this is the way that things are done now. While some small businesses have been able to replace what was lost, the government's task of rebuilding the entire city centre was never going to be quickly realised. It was in the winter of 2012 that our government banded together a team of project experts whose task was to grow a blueprint plan outlining the future development of Central Christchurch and given 100 days to describe the form in which the city would be rebuilt. He said to us as a team, look, be bold, really, really pick up on what the City Council's done. There was 106,000 people submitted to the council process, really trying to deliver what the people have spoken about through the council's documents. The Blueprint team are down the far end. They're working really hard to meet the deadlines. So, which is not far away? Yeah, next week. Here's a chance for us to help support a plan that is going to be sustainable, not only in a green and environmental sense, but actually in an economic sense as well. Give me five minutes, yep. um, I'll get this out and pass it on. Great. And then Our big move was to create this eastern frame right down to High Street. In High Street, we see that as the south gateway to the city centre. Now, if you look up here at um, Victoria Square, let's have three bridges across this river here, which acknowledges Kaipoi Park, which is where Tuahiwi people lived. That also had three gateways into the Pa. Sandasif and Tuam becomes the South Frame, a campus-type landscape with buildings on the edge of the streets, open space down the middle, and car parks out of sight. As I understand it, no new buildings of the past 10 to 20 years have actually been great investments. In fact, I've heard people say they were a failed asset class. We want this to be a pedestrian place. If you want to come into the city, you've got to remember this is a people place and you can't do it quickly. So you, if you're coming in for business or to visit or to shop, you're welcome, but you do it slowly. If we can't attract people to live in here, to shop here, to set up businesses, to invest, then we fail. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, this evening to the Christchurch City Recovery Plan. Tonight is a night of hope and vision for the people of Christchurch and the Canterbury area, and a vision for what will undoubtedly be the, uh, the most livable city in New Zealand. I mean, this will energise Christchurch. This takes us to a new place, and the important thing is that we go there together. A year later in the government's ongoing negotiations with the landholders to develop the new look city is underway. We think the city becomes a much more interesting place if you not just have people working in there, but actually living there as well. We want to see from Manchester Street to Madras, 20, 30,000 people really living back in the city. And the idea being that we want to try and have it sort of linked up with the rest of the city. Latimer Square. This is an area where we want to make a much bigger square, a much greener area. So this whole area here becomes a really special residential area. One of the missions of the planning unit was to make the city smaller, wasn't it? That was one of the big issues we had when we started coming up with the blueprint for the city. The city was too big, it was too spread out. There's always been some residential inside the central city. We want to put more residential in it, 
and do it in a way that makes it a really desirable place to live. Everything in relatively easy reach is the idea of what we're trying to do here. You know, if you lived in here and you worked at the hospital, you can have a really nice choice of routes to get to work without necessarily getting in a car at all. Who's paying for it? The Christchurch people are going to, you know, are going to contribute to building, you know, some of the big anchor projects, stadiums, convention centres, swimming pools, but the government mm. is also putting in, you know, a large share of the money as well. Well, they'd be got... very privileged people living here, wouldn't they? Well, we don't want to make it too privileged. We want to make it, you know, as affordable as possible. I wonder sometimes about the fact that every inch of it's being determined, that, you know, organic growth that well, occurs by people's individual ingenuity is not being we considered enough? No, we really don't want to stifle that. I mean, we do want the entrepreneurs coming up with their cool ideas of how different things will interact. But we think it does make sense we've got so much clear space to have, you know, an overall structure and strategy of where all the big things go. Yeah. How much power does the Minister have in these decisions? Uh, the Minister does have a lot of power, um, but you know, he, the, the discipline there is it's been a, a consultation process. Throughout this thing we've worked closely with the city, with Naitahu, and you know, there will hopefully be more opportunities as we go forward for more input from, from the public as well. You know, it may be that not all the one-way streets survive, our plan is for two of the one-way streets, the ones on um, Kilmore and Salisbury go. We also have been asking the question about whether the speed should be slowed down. We've suggested 30 kilometres an hour. The heart of the city will no longer be bisected by busy one-way streets. The heart of the city will be within those one-way streets. You know, that's the idea of making the city more compact. All Christchurch made gear I'm wearing. Christchurch made jacket, Christchurch made bag. If you can bring more people into the city with these well-designed green spaces, we build something really, really special here. About 70% of the buildings in the central city are coming down. And in some parts of the frame, it's 80 and 90%. So you're in the process of buying up a lot of buildings at the moment, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the, the key areas where we're going to you know, do things, we've bought more than 50% of the land. I guess some people just don't want to go. Some people have actually done some really special things with buildings and now we want to pull them down and do things they don't particularly like. So that's not easy, those, those discussions. Do you take the weekends off a bit? I try to, Gerard, yeah. yeah. You do pretty long hours though, don't you? I do do long weeks, so do I'm you? not complaining. I knew what I was getting myself into when I took the job. Eh? The wall will be a memorial somewhere. We're still working out where that's going to go. But we certainly know CDV is a special place. Most of us know people who died or, or suffered there. In this general area here, yeah. we've got a bus exchange and then a justice precinct where we have the law courts, the police station, probation services, putting them all on one place. There's a bit of argy-bargy, is there not, about who pays for what? Well, you know, when the bills and the billions of dollars, there's always going to be some quite robust discussions around that. And I guess both parties, whether they were the taxpayers or ratepayers, would hope that we were having robust discussions. You know, while we are a proper city, we're kind of a Lego town in some ways. You kind of know who all the key characters are. And all the key characters really want to make this work. If you think about the natural environment, it kind of makes it much easier to do special things with the built environment. You attract good quality built environment around it. So, you know, on the strip there, I think Anthony Goff has got ideas of bringing his bars and restaurants close to the riverbank and really building something, you know, really special there. So this street here ends up being closed off. And so we have a much nicer river area. And on the far side of this whole corner here ends up what we're calling this health precinct. So it's an area where we have uh, medical research facilities, the hospital, the polytech nursing course, right next to a proper, you know, world-class hospital. Are the sheds here staying? The sheds are staying. Are they? The, 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 oh, the sheds cool. are staying. A new park using an old river with the old sheds would be another fabulous corner of the city. Thanks, Roger. It's been great. The pleasure, right? Eh?
Although the city's planned reduction of the number of one-way streets within the frame is welcomed by most, those who live or whose businesses sit just outside the frame will still be affected by the city's current one-way system. Hi, I'm Jill Bradley. We own this building on Tuam Street. We don't like one-way streets because they're bad for business. Hi, my name's Simone Pearson. I lived in Central City for 10 years, and the one-way system cuts right through our community. We're on the corner of Kilmore Street and Barbados Street. This is a one-way street. It has massive volume of cars moving really, really fast. 70k an hour, people cruise along here. Because it's quite open, it feels like people can go fast. All the signals are telling people at, down at Bailey Avenue, right, put your foot on the accelerator because there's a big, big stretch here of road that you can zoom down. You've got two sides of a community. You've got a really busy, noisy road right through it. And so it just breaks that community up and it makes it not safe crossing the road because you've got people going really fast down it. People don't want to live here and people don't want to have businesses here because it just looks really run down. There are no pedestrians. I'm a walker. I never walk on a one-way street. They're thoroughly unpleasant. The government want to bring a lot more residents into the inner city. They're looking at 20,000 new residents, at least, and that is not consistent with a one-way. I wouldn't buy a property on a one-way. It would be miserable. NZTA is a strong lobby group uh, who are advocating for the status quo, which is the preservation of the one-way system. We're on Tuam Street, and the intention is that Tuam Street becomes a one-way, and it replaces Litchfield Street being the one-way. This was a very successful corner prior to the earthquakes. This was a lovely spot. And why are they doing that? Because they've realised that they need an east-west one-way system because the big stadium will block Litchfield Street. Litchfield Street's experienced the slow death that one-ways create. It was a beautiful street, it had beautiful buildings, it was centrally located, but I avoided it, even though I thought, what wonderful potential. I spoke to 10 landlords on Tuam Street, and every single one of them were really distressed at the prospect of Tuam Street becoming one way. There's no analysis of the impact on businesses and right. livability of the city, and that's the real issue. That's where the rubber meets the road. What they actually do is they do all their traffic modelling and they work out that if you have one way here and a two way here, it's going to have be this efficient. And what they do is they measure the time, don't they? And they look at the dollar value of that time, but it doesn't. It, it loses sight of the bigger picture, which is about a livable, commercially viable area. I'm John Skevington and um, I'm the chairman of the Canterbury West Coast Automobile Association District Council. We've always been strong on the one-way streets and the support of the one-way streets. Uh, we believe it's an important part of Christchurch, it has been for nearly 40 years now. If it's not broken, we believe, don't fix it. There has been opposition to the one-way system, but I think a lot of it has been people who uh, own shops and don't want to see the shop traffic disappear, but people possibly forget is that you can get on and off that one-way system whenever you want to. Didn't we want in this chair an idea a, a more livable city? And we still believe that the one-way system caters for that. We've got the new cycle lanes, we've got the total redevelopment of the central city, the possibility of 30 km an hour um, central city zoning, um, so that all creates a more livable city than we had before. So would this one-way street behind us here be, be 30k? Um, no, it wouldn't, no, it wouldn't be 30k, this one here, but uh, I... Would I some of the one-way streets be 30k? No. No, I don't, don't think so. It's just the central city, a zone in the central city. Right. Recent research uh, has shown that, in fact, a one-way network is not very efficient if the, your destination is the inner city because it requires that you take a longer, circuitous route to get to where you want to go. Our vision for Central City is um, a place where uh, it's vibrant, where there's lots of people, 
where you can walk everywhere that you need to with lots of facilities and a strong sense of community. I like Christchurch. I could see Christchurch being like those lovely compact European cities that are full of vibrancy. It is all set up for that, but the one ways are killing it. Where is this? I didn't even know this was here. I oh, know, it's, it's weird. It was, this was like one of the big theatres in town. It was the St. James Theatre. And then it became a picture theatre and the, called the Odeon. And now it's got this whole new open plan look going on where it's sort of much more of an open air thing. Beautiful. Yeah, it's like all the roofs caved in on it, all the woods busted and smashed and broken. It's like they started pulling it down and then stopped. Well, I reckon they should keep something like this and just, you know, so that we have something like this as a memorial of some kind mm. that actually really brings it home. Making use of these extraordinary circumstances has led to inventive new ideas like Cafe Shop 8, splitting rents with social enterprise furniture makers Rekindle, a business with a unique use for waste timber and an innovative philosophy. Rekindle references traditional craft or I guess the value of the old way. It's about the reuse of the timber and harnessing the energy that that material still has. We feel mm. good when we do that kind of stuff, so really important, I think, socially. Rekindle's <laughs> about therapy. It is, yeah, definitely. Rekindle as a concept I developed, yeah, well before the earthquakes, in response to, I mean, a worldwide issue with throwing water away. And I guess the first time I went out and saw the big pile at the Resource Recovery Park, it's an extraordinary physical illustration of the, of the degree of waste. Yeah. Yeah. Such a huge quantity of um, hardwood in there. But yeah, it's mixed in with all kinds of things, which is a worry. At that point where the trucks have just um, emptied their load, at that point that's still potentially accessible, which I'm quite keen to work towards. Because once it goes into the big pile, of course, it's unrecoverable. A lot of my occupational therapy work's been in mental health. I've just worked with a lot of people who suffer from difficulty finding something that's tangible and constructive in their lives. So for me, Rekindle is about provision of those opportunities, and that's, that's really exciting to me. We're not yet in a position, I guess, at Rekindle to invite in people from the community to work in the workshop. We're not set up well enough yet. So instead, at the moment, I'm working with some existing community groups and they're doing some of our denailing. It's a massive help in the wood recovery process. One part of the dream is to have a facility that allows the community to access woodworking with waste as much as they would like to. There could be an export industry. Yeah, maybe. I think for me the, the bigger opportunity as well is in the physical rebuild there are going to be a lot of new commercial spaces, a lot of new office spaces, and so I think there's a place for wood in there. We are making change. We're trying to find a solution to a couple of problems, really. Now that we've got this um, beautiful space in New Regent Street, one of my big aims this year is that we'd have a flow um, of trainee woodworkers who will come through referral from youth agencies, so that we're actually supporting those kids to become work ready, which would be pretty awesome. To me, the furniture just happens to be a byproduct of a process that has its own inherent rewards, but it's the experience people have while they're making it that's most important to me. Mm. Uh, what do you reckon, Rach? What's our city going to look like? Well, I'm just really excited for the green frame. I think that's a wonderful yeah. idea to bring people back into the city, but I mean, there's just so much opportunity. You don't know how it's going to evolve. Yeah, it reminds me of this little, this kid's book I had by the Berenstein Bears, you know, mm -hmm. where, the, where the moral was, take the long way, the short way, never. Mm -hmm. I think that long-term thinking is so important. You know, we don't want business developers hooning in here and turning it into a strip mall, yeah. when it could be such a vibrant, exciting place where people want to live their lives right in here. You Absolutely, know? but I think it's important to remember what happened here and a memorial on the CTV site to honour the people who lost their lives, I think yeah. is really important for the city. 
Oh man. Back in 2011, local artist Peter Magendi found his own way to grieve for the deaths of the 185 people who lost their lives in the February earthquake. I come each day just to see if everything's OK. Um, sometimes I find myself just sort of talking to them, you know, saying goodbye and good morning. You'll be OK. The site for Peter's unofficial memorial became available when the Oxford Terrace Baptist Church was destroyed by the February quake, providing a blank canvas with which to work. We laid here 185 square metres of ready lawn on this old site of the church, and uh, then there's 185 chairs. It was just a private response, just with myself and Joyce, uh, my wife. We decided I'll paint a chair, and we got together 185 eventually. And uh, for the first anniversary of the earthquake, that's where we were. Dear Reese, eh? That's his very chair. As far as we all painted it. There were flowers left in that baby carrier for oh, a couple of months, actually. Yeah, just kept being renewed, fresh flowers. Unfortunately, after a year and a half, the church requested their land back, and Peter was forced to find a new home for his unique tribute. We're on the corner of Madras and Cashel, diagonally opposite the CTV site, and it is more harsh than the other site. But it's in a more appropriate spot in many ways because it's right over the road from where so many died. That's right. Yeah. It has become quite, uh, quite a place to visit, and I think it works on lots of levels and in lots of ways. I've always viewed it as not so much of a memorial as a, a remembrance. It's like some woman telling me that, that she lived the life of her son, from the little baby carrier to the high chair to the little ch chair he had at school, and then a, he had a swivel chair in his office. And it does a, tap into people's yeah. grief. Eh? And so the whole lot of chairs do that, not just one. Right. They are very real and, and alive memories for them. Quite different from going to the interment site, which is a cemetery. And I, you know, I've been here, I came one night and there was about six guys in suits, uh, all sitting on the various bar stools of the high chairs, oh, the yeah. higher chairs, yeah, yeah. and they just raised their, their cans and all in silence. Yeah, I thought, no, you know, it provided a space for it. Yeah, a nice way to remember. Yeah. Really nice. Yeah. Has it been successful? I, I think it has been, and I think that's the reason why we just try to maintain it. So I think there was about 20 odd chairs we'd lost through Oh, vandalism and a number stolen and about a similar sort of number that are broken down in the weather but that still leaves us with about 130 of the original chairs that are sitting here that went outside you know 18 months ago I did tell someone when they asked me how I felt about them being uh, vandalized I just said well you just got on with it it's just like Jesus said you know don't let the bastards win <laughs> on air.